in the heart of the bustling city, where dreams and ambitions intertwine like the threads of a tapestry. There emerged a show that defied conventions and norms, offering viewers a glimpse into the intricate mind of the mastermind behind it all. A remarkable journey of creativity and innovation began with Lucky Louie, a show that dared to venture beyond the beaten path of traditional sitcoms. Lucky Louie was an anomaly in the world of television, breaking free from the familiar constraints that had long confined the genre. The sets, unlike their traditional counterparts, seemed more akin to a theater stage. They bore no resemblance to the warm, cookie-cutter homes of shows like Everybody Loves Raymond or Friends. This deviation from the norm was a breath of fresh air, setting the stage for what was to come. But Lucky Louie was no ordinary sitcom. It was a groundbreaking series, living on the edge of conventionality. A liberating element was HBO's unshackling of content, offering the freedom to explore themes, profanity and nudity that were taboo on regular TV. This working class family had a raw authenticity that resonated with audiences, despite its eventual cancellation after just one season. It seemed different was not always destined to succeed in the traditional world of TV. I've always said this, that you get more information from failure than you do success because there's forensics, there's a dead body on the floor, and there's all kinds of information. Stand-up is always the standby for me, like that's what I do. That's what I am, I'm a comic. If something I'm doing as a stand-up leads me back to like, hey, this might be a show, then I'll try it. I'll try anything that I think might be good. I don't care about, like, well, I failed at it before. You know what I mean? Who cares? Try it again. Louis C.K.'s journey was far from over. His insatiable creativity propelled him forward, leading him to a pivotal crossroads where his evolving stand-up career intersected with his enduring passion for storytelling. When FX offered him a new show, the comedian was at a unique juncture. He agreed under one condition, creative autonomy. Yeah, when I got the FX show, I didn't need a TV show. I really didn't care if I did one or not because I was having such a good time on the road and I was making a ton of money on the road, I mean, for me. And uh, I was happy. And so people were asking me if I wanted to do a TV show. So right. my thought was, the only reason I'll do a TV show is if they just throw so much money at me that I could maybe stay home for a while, be a better yeah. father. FX came and said, do a show. It can be anything you want. And I said, how much? And they said, 200000 an episode. And I said, there's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> no yeah. way I'm doing that. And I said, the only way I'm doing it is if you can't. You don't even know what the show's about. I'm not going to show you the script. You just give me that money. Give me $200,000 in a bank wire, and I will give you a DVD of a show. <laughs> they wired it to you? Yeah, like literally, I set up a company and they wired the money. That was it. Money wasn't the driving factor, as the meager $200,000 per episode reflected. It was about having the freedom to birth his unbridled visions into reality. Louis quietly entered the television arena, yet its impact would become evident in due time. A show that fearlessly broke the rules, this innovative masterpiece defied continuity and plot norms, juxtaposing unrelated scenes, often weaving in stand-up acts and delving into a myriad of emotions. It was no longer just comedy, it was an exploration of the human experience. I decided I don't even want to think about what this show's about until the money's in the bank. And we got the money. Yeah. And then I started writing and thinking of stuff to shoot. I didn't write the whole, usually you have to write the whole thing and they read it and they give you notes and then you rewrite it with their ideas until they like it. 
but this way, like I wrote one scene without knowing who was going to be in the show or what it's about. I just wrote one scene. I wrote a scene where I'm on a date with a girl and I wrote like three or four scenes and then I thought, that's about all I want to watch of that. I don't want to watch her then go, you know what, you're kind of a nice guy or me go, you know, I just wanted to see 10 minutes of it. And I thought, that's enough of that. And then I wrote this thing of this story that happened to me and my kids on a bus and I wrote that and yeah. that seemed short and I thought, that's all also. A regular show, you'd go like, well, okay, to make it half an hour, I gotta have me and the teacher kind of connect. And as soon as it got on interesting, I just stopped writing. And so then I had a couple pieces, and then I thought, yeah, so maybe the show has a couple stories in it, sometimes. Hmm. And then what do I do between? Do I talk to the camera? I can't, I don't like talking to camera, so I thought, why don't I just do stand-up, just do stand-up. So I just called it together, and I got some music that I really liked. I got some guys to play jazz music for me in a studio, and it made it like, like a movie. Absurdity was Louis' ally, with events unfolding without rhyme or reason. Take, for instance, the scene where he inspects an apartment only to witness a homeless man be replaced by another homeless man by two men in suits. The show embraced the inexplicable as a form of art. Each episode was a New York short film, offering a glimpse into the life and mind of the show's creator. It was a canvas painted with the artist's unique worldview. He would eventually have comedians and writers sit on his couch as he wrote episodes, using them as a sounding board to help him refine his ideas and filter their input into his stories. Some episodes concluded with striking immediacy, offering self-contained stories that demanded no additional unravelling. Consider, for instance, the episode in which Louis found himself unexpectedly entrusted with the care of his niece. Thank you for doing this. I have no choice. I need to get back on this train to Philadelphia right now. I will be back for her in two well, days. But, but you're both staying with me. That was the plan. No. Just her. Two days. I don't know anybody her age. Yeah, she's 13. You don't need to do much for her. I have to go. Gotta be shitting me. Over the course of a single day, Louis embarked on a mission to bridge the gap with this obstinate young teenager. Saw them, but uh, you can be in here if you want. If you. Uh... Amy, it's been about four hours, and I don't have any. I haven't heard a sound in there. Listen, I, I gotta know you're not a dead kid in my house right now. So I'm, Amy. You want to get something that you want some food or get some? I want to go to Fontana's. You want to go what? To Fontana's. The day's adventures took them to a punk club and surprisingly culminated in the strengthening of their bond. I had this idea of taking on a kid that's not my kid's age. When you're a parent, you're an expert on the day you're parenting. I'm an expert at a six and a nine year old. And beyond that, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Luckily, you take it one day at a time. But the idea of being projected forward to a 13-year-old was very scary to me. These were stories that needed to be shared, their narrative threads tied neatly without the need for further elaboration. Hello? Hello, I'm calling from Mercy Hospital in Philadelphia. We're holding a Carleen Walter. I believe she's your sister. Yeah, I have her. I have her daughter. Well, if you're the next of kin, you should retain custody of her until her mother is well. Unless, of course, you're not capable of caring for her. No. Yeah, she'll be okay here. As the series unfolded, Louis' creative experimentation soared to unprecedented heights. One narrative arc delved into his relentless quest to secure the coveted hosting role for The Late Show. David Letterman is retiring. It's over. I have to replace him. I brought you here to ask you if you'd be interested in the job. Within this captivating storyline, he found himself crossing paths with none other than the enigmatic David Lynch. 
Lynch's character took on the role of a mentor, meticulously training and preparing individuals for the prestigious position of hosting The Late Show. This narrative voyage peeled back the layers of Hollywood's inner workings, shedding light on the cutthroat landscape that defined the entertainment industry. I love David Lynch. I've always loved him, like a warm love for him, not just thinking he's great. His movies are a massive thing for me. I've learned when you work with people that are heroes to you, you have to be really careful, especially if you're directing them. It's unsettling to act and you feel a little untethered. And the director makes you feel like someone else is in control and it helps you. So when the director is someone going, oh my God, I'm like the biggest fan of you, you know? When he showed up, I said hi to him quickly. Do you have any questions? Thank you for coming. And I stayed away from him. Now, have you ever had any experience with being funny? Yeah, I'm a... I'm a comedian. You're a comedian. Well, I've known you for a week and you haven't made me laugh once. I had no idea you were a comedian. I thought you were a newsman. Well, all right, let's see it. See what? See the funny, make me laugh. Go. Go? Go, funny. Three, two, one, I'm go. I'm not that kind of funny. You're whatever you have to be to make people laugh. Anytime, anywhere, anyone. You turn it on on a dime. You get that belly moving, son, or you're out. You know what your problem is? You're, you're just a pencil penis parade. Ooh, I'm you just bought yourself another week. Go home and get some rest. When we did the scene in the office where I dance around, it was really humiliating. I'm doing this in front of this guy who I love, and it gave me a stomachache. At one point, out of self-consciousness, I said, this isn't even funny. And David said, no, it's not funny. It's not supposed to be. He said, Jack doesn't give you the extra week because he thought you were funny. Don't make any mistake of that. He gave you the extra week because you did something. He finally got you to try and do something. And by the way, that extra week was pretty close to you didn't get it. He had a few things to say like that. I got to hang out with him and smoke cigarettes with him even though I hadn't smoked in a year. There were also episodes that appeared to lack a clear purpose, yet they left indelible imprints on the viewers' minds. One such episode, for instance, found Louis on a date with a woman at a donut place. However, their evening took an unexpected turn when a group of teenagers intruded, subjecting Louis to humiliating bullying antics right in front of his date. Driven by a mix of frustration and curiosity, Louis decided to follow one of the teenage tormentors to his home, peering into a world where he uncovered the intricate dynamics of parenting. Hey, um, uh, you don't owe me, but, uh, are you selling something then? No, no. Who's this? Uh, I'm here because, uh, you have a son named Sean. Yeah? Well, I had a little trouble with him tonight. Like what? Well, he threatened me. He threatened to beat me up. Uh, would, would you come in, please? Yeah, sure. Jimmy, turn that shit down. I'm playing! Turn it down, back there! Sean, get down here. Sean! Get down here! What, 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 what? Are you bothering this guy? What the hell? What did you do? What the hell are you doing what here? What did you say? Listen, I don't know what this guy told you. That's that your goddamn shit, shit. Shit. I don't know what he told you. I don't know what he told you. Tell him you're sorry, goddammit. Stop hitting him. How do you think he turned out like this? What are you talking about? He's no good. Oh, don't say that. He's your kid. He probably could have been a good kid. He's obviously smart. But what was, how, you teach him to just hit people. What was he gonna be but a stupid bully? I mean, you never gave him a chance. Hey, screw you. Who the hell are you? What? Get the hell out of my house, you, what are you Tell me how to raise ah, my kid. Ah, ah, Go back ah, to New York, ah, you ah, bottom ah, In this remarkable exploration, the episode revealed that the roots of a child's behavior often intricately intertwined with the influences of their parents. He's 18 now, you know. I don't know what to do. 
Listen, I don't know, I don't know what you're dealing with, you know? I mean, I got two kids, but they're girls, and the oldest one's eight, so I don't know, I mean... I guess I just... I would go with maybe not hitting them. That doesn't seem like such a great idea. Well, well that's what I know. My dad hit me, and his dad him. And how's that going? <laughs> yeah. The writing of Louis had a stream of consciousness quality, where events cascaded organically without adhering to conventional storytelling structures. The only constraints were those imposed by real-life production capabilities, allowing for a fluid and unpredictable narrative. The essence of Louis transcended comedy. It was about evoking emotions and creating empathy. Much like his stand-up, the show challenged our perceptions of the world and our place in it, offering a roller coaster of emotions. There was no pattern, no predictability, and that was the true beauty of the show. It was art in its purest form, masterfully crafted by an artist who dared to break the mold and reshape our understanding of television. Louis was not just a show, it was a testament to the power of creativity unshackled.